I can't see my notes, that's it. Um, welcome to this, something like the third presentation I've done. This started somewhat accidentally in the sense that what I was going to do was um, create some training for potential observers within our group. Then the first session got advertised nationally by mistake. Uh, and so we thought, oh, whatever, we'll, we'll stay with that. So it's also grown like top two, the number of people joining it. So I don't know where we're quite up to at the moment, but quite in number. So a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, the presentation itself is going to be about 30 minutes. And then we've got about another 30 minutes of questions and comments and so on. Um, <coughs> What I'm going to be talking about today is overtaking, as you probably gathered, based on the, the uh, associate's handbook or observer handbook that we use for training. And I'm particularly going to be talking about single carriageway roads. And I have to say mainly about cars, because that's why I know we happen to be a car group and so on. But that's broadly what I'm going to be talking about, what we're going to do. But let me introduce myself first. My name is David Reeves. And I've been an observer in this group for five, six years or so now. Um, retired IT consultant. I first passed an, an IAM test way back in 1980 something, 86 I think it was, when I lived up in Warrington and became an observer in that group until we moved, um, moved a couple of times. And then eventually at one stage I walked, I noticed there's somebody in Shropshire, I joined the Telford group because I was living in um, uh, near Market Drayton at the time, that was the nearest one, and did a bit more observing, but then various things happened, family, whatever, and gradually dropped out until, until say about five or six years ago and came back to the IAM having um, did a Rosper test first, then I did a Masters, the usual sorts of stuff. But now I, I look after observer training. And as I said, the original idea of the presentations was as part of a training package for potential observers. Now, what's struck me over the last few months, particularly talking to one of our newer observers, was how difficult it is to teach overtaking. It's something we, I don't, I know I can own this statement. I don't think I was teaching it particularly well because of the various limitations. I'll talk about that in a moment. And I also think it's quite hard to do well. And so this is really what's behind this uh, talk, how we can approach what sort of things that we need to pass on as observers to new associates with regard to overtaking. So as I say, I'm primarily talking about overtaking on single carriageway roads because most people, yeah, give or take, uh, okay on the other stuff we can polish things up a bit but they're okay with that but they're more concerned about how they deal with single carriageway roads this sort of thing now um, I, I thank Dave from Durham for this quote it's the most dangerous thing that we do and probably the least taught um, very little is done at sort of ordinary learner driver sort of level and <laughs> Again, we have some limitations about what we can do within the IAM doing this. But nevertheless, it is potentially very dangerous. There's no getting away from that. If you've got two vehicles heading towards each other at 60, obviously they're closing at 120. And according to Roadcraft, 90% of head-on collisions are fatal. So that's always at the back of our mind or even the forefront of our mind. It's also highly dynamic. In other words, in simple terms, lots of moving parts. You've got to gauge the distance available, the distance required, the relative speeds of traffic, all sorts of other hazards I could go on, but there's a lot of things to be considered. And so we need to build up quite a lot of judgment to be able to do this effectively. Now, this is hard because if you think about similar complex tasks within driving, I don't know, complex roundabout, say, or dual carriageway or something like this, mm -hmm. you spend quite a lot of time thinking about it and practicing things and, and creating a, a confidence and a capability and a safe way of doing those things with lots of pointers. But we don't seem to do that quite the same way when it comes to overtaking. So I think a lot of people come to us who are 
the sort of person who's fairly safe to start with actually avoid <clears throat> overtaking. I've heard people say, oh, I just don't do it. And you think, really? And often they're thinking about this sort of thing um, where they're coming up behind a slow moving car of some description and they, they don't know what to do with it. So if they're doing, that car's doing 50 or something, maybe they'll hang back, they'll just wait. But why is that happening? Why are people so concerned about this manoeuvre? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. It might be they've had a near miss. I've certainly talked to people and had associates who've been in that situation. Um, they've seen it done badly. Well, we've all been in that situation where you sort of see some of the driver come screaming past and you go, oh my God, and wonder how they managed to get in in time and so on. And it also, I think, induces a certain degree of panic, a, st a stress reaction, because you know, if you're in a line of traffic and you're <clears throat> the one near the front, you can feel the pressure from all the others behind you wanting you to make that overtake and not quite sure what you should be doing or not totally happy with the manoeuvre. So that, you know, when you don't know what to do and you're out of control of it, that's highly stressful. So it often goes with it that it's quite a stressful thing to do. Now, just to take that a stage further, I think often you get this kind of dialogue with people who haven't been trained. They come up behind some slow moving vehicle like this, and the thought process is along the lines of, thinks, I should overtake this. Um, oh, I'm not sure if I can see far enough ahead. Uh, what do I need to do? Um, uh, not sh what speed's the lorry doing? Oh, they're still quite slow. Oh, but it's a fast road. What if something comes? Um, what if what if somebody comes out of that junction? Or what if? Um, oh, I could have gone then. How many times have you heard that one? Yeah. Oh, I could have gone. Oh, it's too late now. Anyway, um, few. And then there's a feeling of relief that they haven't actually engaged with the overtake yeah. at all. So. What I think we need to do is to provide that basic structure, unlike a lot of the other things you do in driving or advanced driving where we're adding new skills. This is about dealing with some very simple method, a kind of rules of thumb that enables people to safely overtake and think about the process that they're doing. So, This is a skill we need. Now, even for those people who feel uncomfortable about overtaking other cars, I've got a feeling it's a particularly British thing that it's something, it's akin to uh, jumping the queue. You know, you don't overtake anybody because then, um, you know, it's akin to queue jumping. But even if you don't like doing that bit or you think, well, actually, I haven't got a fast car, I'm not going to do it, you're still going to come across this sort of thing, the slow moving JCB. Um, the tractor, the bunch of cyclists, or now I've been told, Henny's corrected many times upon the collective noun for a bunch of cyclists. It's a peloton, a peloton of cyclists, but whatever it is, we're going to use much the same sort of technique. So it's <coughs> worth having some laying down some basic rules, some rules of thumb that we could use whenever we're overtaking to get away from that internal dialogue that I mentioned earlier. So, first rule of thumb, make the decision early. We've come up behind a slow moving vehicle or slow moving car, whatever it is. You can either make the decision at that point, I will overtake this vehicle when it's safe to do so, or I'll not overtake it, there's no advantage to be gained. Now, you might know that there's actually a building site just around this corner and the guy in the JCB is almost certainly going to turn into it. There is no point in doing an overtake. Just hold back for a bit. It'll be fine. Maybe you yourself are going to turn off in a quarter of a mile. No point in overtaking the car unnecessarily. But if you know actually you're going to be following this guy in the JCB for the next two miles up to the next roundabout, you might take that view. Now, this isn't 
I am going hell for leather, death before dishonor, overtake at all costs. This is saying I want to overtake this person when it's safe to do so. But having made that decision, that's the first stress point dealt with. I'm now in a second mode now of how I can actually deal with the overtake. So that's the first rule of thumb. Make the decision early that you will do an overtake if it's possible and safe to do so. Right, here's a nice straight road. Those of you in the Northampton area might recognize it as the No Bottle Road, it's near where I live. It is actually a former Roman road. Somewhere behind those trees is a Roman villa. Well, obviously there isn't a Roman villa. Under the field somewhere apparently there's a Roman villa. Is it okay to overtake on that road? Would you do a no, had the, obviously there's no vehicle, but if there were, would you overtake there? Yes. And it would, depends. Okay, I'll tell you. That's about half a mile from where we are to the limit point, right at the end of that road where it was a bit of a bend it's about half a mile okay, okay. to overtake or not yeah. uh, maybe <laughs> i tell you what just to yeah. make it easier just at this very second a car has come into view so in, instead of it being the limit point there at that point a car <clears throat> has just come into view still half a mile but i'll stick a sign up for you oncoming Half a mile, okay. Does that make it easier or more difficult? Yeah. Now a lot of, interestingly, a lot of people will say it's more difficult because now I can see something heading towards me. On the other hand, a lot when you talk to trained police drivers, police driving instructors, they will say actually they prefer that because they know what they're dealing with. They can actually gauge um, all sorts of other information about the vehicle that's coming towards them. Okay, so far so good. I'm going to stick another sign up. There you go. Now, apologies for the sort of um, graphics here. I may be halfway is further down the road, but it was hard to kind of position these <laughs> pretend signs. Um, and anyway, I was out for a jog, so it's quite hard hammering them all in. <laughs> but I've stuck another sign at the halfway point. In fact, I might as well stick a blooming great sign there. Why have I stuck a blooming great box thing in the way at the halfway point? Well, the reason is if this car coming the other way is doing the same speed as us, let's say 60, doesn't really matter, that's where we're going to meet halfway. So if I've just committed to an overtake, that halfway point is where I'm going to meet the other vehicle assuming neither of us do something else like abort it or stop or whatever so that halfway point is quite significant really i very definitely want my overtake to be completed completely completed does that make sense by the time i get to that halfway mark now actually I might want it to be completed somewhat earlier. Otherwise, we'd have to do some sort of, uh, what is it, the red arrows type maneuver where two sort of jets zoom at each other at high speed at 600 miles per hour and do a kind of flip at the last moment and just miss each other by inches. We're not encouraging that. So maybe I need to stick my sign at the third marker to give me a little bit of a buffer. So maybe what I should be doing is dividing the road up into thirds. So there's my third nearest to me. I should, and again, I apologize for the sort of graphics that maybe isn't a third, but you get the idea. This bit is my third. I can do my overtake and all the rest of it in that bit. That's their third. They can do what they like in that bit. And we've got a buffer, a no man's land by we should have completed, we should have planned anyway to have completed our overtake in that space. <clears throat> if we haven't, we've still got a little bit of leeway before we actually meet in the middle. So I've made a number of assumptions here. The first assumption is obviously that we're going at the same speed as each other. If I'm going faster, we're go I'm gonna be further down this road and likewise, if they're going faster, um, I'm gonna be further down this road. 
but it gives us a rule of thumb, something to start judging how far we need in order to overtake. So here's your, well, we've had one rule of thumb, we've had made the decision early. The second one then is try and estimate a third of the distance available and try and plan to do the overtaking that. But, okay, the next question then is how much space do I need? If that's what I'm planning for, this bit from kind of here to where I am now, have I got enough space to do my overtake? How much space do I actually need? So, okay, next rule of thumb coming up. Right, this is a thought experiment. What I want you to do is imagining you're driving through this nice, quiet, leafy little village. Um, let's call it um, Great Brington, because <laughs> that's what it's called. And you're going to drive past and we're going to overtake this car here. Right, here. Let me get my amazing laser pointer. We're going to go past this car here. Yeah, I heard somebody whisper, yeah, come on, that's stationary. That's easy. Yes, it's easy. We're going to go past that stationary car. So, in fact, let's do that. We've got this green zone. I painted the green zone on just like the other one. So we're going to drive past. We want to be sort of a distance where we could pull in. I'm asking you to kind of estimate how long it would take to do that. There you go. We can drive past it. Amazing graphics in this one. You've got to be impressed. Turn off my laser pointer. Then I'll do it again. How long is that? Three, four seconds. Let's do it one more time. One, two, three, four-ish. Three, four seconds. But hang on. Yeah, that's cheating. It's stationary. But here's another scenario, right? There's the red car overtaking this slow moving green van. Let's say that one's doing 30 and this one is doing 60. The relative speed is 30. We're going past them at 30 miles per hour. So it's the same relative to the van. It'll take us whatever it took three, four seconds to go past them at that speed. So that kind of gives us an idea, firstly, how long it takes. We say, well, hang on, they were stationary. Yeah, the difference that means is that in that three or four seconds, doing now twice the speed, we've gone twice as far. So if I come back to my diagram as I come past I don't stop here I'm going to be somewhere up the road here somewhere by this cottage or something I've traveled twice as far can we judge that sort of distance well yeah if that is we've got in our mind how long it takes to go past the stationary car well as a rule of thumb it's about twice that now again I hear brain, even from here I can hear various brains ticking and and so on. This is a massive rule of thumb. There's all sorts of, of assumptions I've made here about speed and so on. What if this person isn't doing 30, they're doing 40? Well, obviously, I'm going to be much further up the road by the time I can come in again. What if they're doing 57 and I'm doing 60? Well, that's like going past at three miles an hour. That's like walking past these cars. It's not going to take three seconds. It's going to take much longer. And you can start to soon envisage it gets further and further up the road. Mm -hmm. So while we can bear that basic rule of thumb, we've really got to hold in mind our relative speeds here. If it's about that, well, it's about double what it was going past those cars. If it's something else, we've got to bear that in mind. But this is the kind of skill, this is the kind of judgment we're trying to build up. So we've got some rules of thumb. We've got, we've said, make a decision early. I've said, divide the road up into the road that you can see to be clear into thirds. 
and we're starting to get an idea how much space I might need to do the overtake in. What about the techniques we're supposed to use? Now I've taken this from um, the highway code and it says, pull out early, get a view, don't cut in and move back in good time. Which is all very well, um, but you ha need a heck of a lot of road space. And I would contend this is fine particularly for dual carriageway, you check your mirrors, move out, whatever, um, and you know there's nothing coming the other way, or shouldn't be anyway. For ordinary overtakes on superway, it's quite difficult because you need a very long length of road to be able to do this. But as I say, fine for dual carriageways, and by and large, trainees are usually okay with this. They've usually done this on dual carriageways, motorways and so on, lots of times. They're less happy, not unreasonably, doing this on a single carriageway road. Now, from a rolling overtake point of view, from our point of view, this sometimes works. If we come, a, come across a slow moving truck and there's a massive great long road, we can just move out, get the view, and hardly any change of speed is necessary. We might decide we can overtake immediately. We might need to change the speed a little bit. We probably might consider a lower gear. Obviously, we're going to check the mirrors before we move out, and we move out nice and early for the view. But generally, that's straightforward. From a training point of view, we don't have to do too much with this method as a rule, particularly on dual carriageways. But we rarely get that opportunity to do that sort of overtake on ordinary roads. So this diagram is the one that's taken from the observer's handbook, the same one the associates get. And it's a staged overtake. Firstly, we go to a following position two seconds away from the vehicle we're going to overtake. Uh, then it says we move up to an overtaking position somewhat closer. Often we talk about about a second away from it where we get ready. We do some preparation. We might engage a lower gear or we might take, uh, if you're an automatic, it might be um, taking sports mode or drop it, manually dropping a gear or whatever works in your particular car. And of course, we're going to check that um, there's nobody coming. So we've got to check the mirrors. Then we go for the overtake itself. We move out sideways. We have the look and then we accelerate and then move into the gap. And that's it. That's essentially what we have to teach. Now, that's all very well, but it's, there's a lot of judgment and there's a lot of things going on in that. So we need to probably go into that in a little bit more detail. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at this. There's, a, there's an amazing graphic that I created. It took me quite a long time, so I'm very proud of it. So I'm just gonna let that one run through and then talk it through. We come up behind the car, we recognize we want to overtake them, close the gap, go out for a look, and we've made the overtake in the very first part of the straight. In order to do that, we've come onto the wrong side of the road about here as soon as we can get a decent view and started that. So we, in order to do that, we've had to consider that I want to overtake about there, close the gap in that bit, and do that. So that decision I'm going to overtake is probably back here somewhere. So what we're saying with this is that the secret to this is in the planning. And so we need to anticipate that we're going to do the overtake. Maybe because of local knowledge, we know that a good spot is coming up, or it might be what I call a sort of scale electric um, road planning where bends are just there to join up straights and if we've got a series of bends well there's a fair chance that there's a straight that follows it even if we don't know the road we might make that guess because we're not going to commit to the overtake till we know for definite so we can plan for it we definitely need to do the preparation we close the gap we move up into the correct position 
we move to the outside, we move to the left, as it were, so that we can get the earliest possible view. We have to anticipate what other road users are doing. Is this bloke going to be awkward about our overtake? If, we, if so, we just, we'll probably decide not to bother with the overtake. We can take the appropriate gear that we mentioned or, or, or use your automatic gearbox in whichever way it decides. And we can check the mirror. We're not about to be overtaken by some other vehicle. So by the time we get to the next stage of moving out to get the view, we can really look down the view, look down here, we can assess it. Is there anything else I need to be aware of? Any other road users, like maybe a cyclist over here that I couldn't see before? Are there any junctions that were masked to me, let's say, to the side road? Basically, any new hazards that I couldn't see, which would mean that I abort this. But it takes that planning. So what are the sorts of things trainees are going to get wrong? Well, for a starter, poor anticipation, because if you haven't trained in this, why would you think about overtaking as you come into a series of bends? So if they only think about the overtake when they're about here on the straight, they, they'll have missed it. They need to do a fairly rapid assessment of the hazards when they get to this position where the car is there. And so they need to look at that. They might overestimate the distance available if we haven't got those sort of guidance of trying to plan to do an overtake in that first third of the road. <clears throat> and the other very, very common one, and it was certainly one I had when I was sort of trained by somebody else, was maintaining that gap, that uh, safety gap there, because you're moving out for a look. If something appears, you spot something here that it causes you to book, you've got to move backwards. You've got to move back into that. So you must have that space available. So if you come out for the look, every sort of sinew in your body wants you to kind of overtake, put your foot on the accelerator, and you've got to resist that temptation like mad while you have that look. If you don't, and the front of your car is, I've overdone this, but is past the green car, you can't get back in. And what happens as well is if this guy is helpful, they slow up and make it even worse. So you've actually got to look, maintain that gap until you're happy the overtake is on. And then finally, there's, as I say, there's a, an overwhelming desire to put your foot hard down to the floor and zoom past. And so you're now going at whacking great speed all the way down here and into the next hazard at high speed. So what we're trying to do is simply increase the speed to an appropriate one to do the overtake and come back into the gap that you've identified. So these are the typical things we need to work on with somebody if we're training this. And this is difficult because this is quite a, and I think this is where the difficulty comes. So how do we teach it? Now, the first thing to say is actual opportunities on a, a training run, observed run, are quite rare when you get all of the things come together where you've got slow moving vehicle and uh, sl you can overtake <laughs> below the national speed limit um, at legal speeds. So how do the police do it? Because they're the other who professionally train um, to road craft. Well, they've got a dispensation. They can drive at high speeds and so on. This is something we, as a road safety organization really can't condone for lots of reasons. The other way that's been used by a number of groups up and down the country is to create opportunities. You send two cars out, maybe with another observer and another trainee driving it, and you kind of leapfrog so that one car drives along at 40, you can practice coming up to the um, following position, moving up to the overtake, going out for a look, coming back in, dropping back and so on. And then when they're happy with that, practice the overtaking. Um, this has a number of advantages uh, that certain variables are taken out of the equation, like the, you don't know how the driver is going to react, but you do know in this scenario, because um, they're expecting it, they're gonna keep a constant speed and so on. However, 
for a variety of reasons, some of them are, which aren't completely clear to me, this has been discouraged in the past by headquarters, um, discouraged, stroke, banned. Uh, I think there are various reasons given, which I'm not going to go into, but it seems to be what would happen, does this sort of show a bad picture of the IM? Does it look like we're doing some weird and wonderful stuff on the road that might be bad publicity? And if, God forbid, there was an accident while we were doing this, that would reflect very, might reflect very badly in the press if it came out, that's what we were doing. So this method is currently, uh, as far as I'm aware, discouraged stroke banned by headquarters. So this leaves us with only a few alternatives, really. We might come across other slow, slow road users, cyclists, tractors, and so on, if we're lucky, and we can use the same technique. However, what it doesn't do really is, is allow us the sort of judgment techniques that I've mentioned beforehand that you need to sort of overtake at slightly higher speeds. Well, we can go with more theoretical training, which kind of works to a point, but this is a fundamentally a theoretical skill. Uh, sorry, this is a practical skill. We really need to encourage people's um, perception of this and their judgment and so on. So we need other ways of doing it. Now, if the ones above are really kind of ruled out, all what we can do really is to deconstruct the teaching at the learning outcomes and teach them separately. What do I mean by that? Well, we've seen that we need to be able to do things like dealing with moving from a following position to an overtaking position and moving out for a look and timing how long it would take for the overtake. Well, we may be able to do some of these elements on a dual carriageway. We find a slower moving vehicle of some description and in relative safety, we can practice those things. And then on a single carriageway road without doing an overtake, we can practice things like moving out for a look. I know that appears in both places, but some people are very unwilling to move across the central marker sort of thing onto the wrong side of the road, onto the offside. We can have them look for what I call no-go hazards, anything that you definitely would not go for an overtake under this situation. And we can talk about assessing distances. Okay, there's a car coming towards us. Have we got time to do an overtake, given it's going to take three, four seconds, whatever um, you've decided? Where would we be in that? So we can do, we can deconstruct those learning outcomes in order to teach them separately. However, it is difficult. We're really we could do with putting those things together. So this, I'm looking at the time again. In summary, this is really all I've got to say. It is a, the most dangerous thing that road users do and, it's a, and it is least trained for. At the least we can give people some rules of thumb to make a decision early, to plan for being overtaking in a third of the road available and some guidance as to what kind of distance they're likely to need, but it still remains hard to teach because of the constraints we've said. And I think the only option we're really left with at the moment then is deconstructing it and teaching the individual skills. Anyway, that's 35 minutes, slightly over my uh, time estimate, but that's all I've got to say on this one. So I'm going to just give you two seconds to unshare this and then we'll open things.